I kept saying to the boys, like, I don't know, this could be the last album we ever record. It is hard to do it, but there is a beauty in being honest with yourself and embracing your flaws and also, you know, discarding the things about yourself that aren't good. If you think a relationship honeymoon period is something, you know, try a band one. Because, <laughs> you, yeah, know, yeah, you, you know, you're sure, figuring man. out band life, you know, tours. This album sort of kind of represents coming out of that period. Generally, yeah, you've kind of redefined that song in my head a little. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a very in a very funny way so maybe yeah. there'll be a part two on the fourth album yeah. then <laughs> i think the, the best moments in music are the ones that that are not replicable have you ever been surprised at the popularity of say wilt which on paper you really shouldn't, shouldn't be like a massive yeah, singer, yeah, like a massive yeah, song, but it's yeah. still one of your biggest. I think, you know, in another planet, we don't write singles and we just write six minute songs and, and we're a far crueler band almost, you know what I mean? But we, we do try and have our cake and eat it. I think Caesar's uh, even Caesar happy. is he, invited. He's happy about that. He's looking forward to it. He has been a holding absence fan for as long as I have. Oh. <laughs> Primordial Radio. Primordial Radio. It is release day Friday. Today we are celebrating a truly phenomenal album, one that I am so excited for you to hear. And I have no doubt the front man of the band is going to be very excited for you to hear it as well. Because it's been, I would say, quite a bit of a long time in the making because this album really is part of a trilogy joining me now lucas woodland of holding absence dude how you doing i'm good man yeah i'm very happy to finally be you know at the end of a very long journey like you said you know it's, it's great so can't, i just can't wait for, to hear people's thoughts on this new album you know how how difficult is it sort of that 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 whole journey you know and mentally as well with an album campaign where like at the very beginning you're like i finally get to talk about it and then at the end you're like i just don't want to talk about it. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, there, there is. Um, I mean, it's it's bittersweet, but I, I will say, the more you, the more you do it, the better you get at answering things. So at the beginning, you're like fresh faced and excited, and at the end, you may be haggard, but you've got all the good answers ready to go already. You know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 as we're speaking, it's sort of like you know midsummer, and I I, I feel like perhaps we're getting a both getting a little bit of a break in the run of festivals and shows and everything yeah. like that but it looks like it's been a great summer for you so far slam dunk 2000 trees which i managed to catch you at how's all that been going yeah really good man you know we're um we're fortunate enough to be pretty much just a full-time touring band now you know so we started the year with like three months straight touring and we're ending the year with three months straight touring so it's um it's really nice to come home rest relax you know try and you know, enjoy the peace and quiet for a change. But then at the same time, like you said, you know, once a month we we had Sam Dunk and then the next month we had 2003. So it's it's kind of nice because it's like I haven't completely downed downed tools, if that makes sense. You know, mm. I've I've been fortunate enough to relax for a month and then do my favorite thing in the world again and not be sick of it. Almost. So then, you know. Yeah, yeah, you say relax for a month there. I've often wondered what musicians do with like a month off because, you know, most folks who work a nine to five would be like, oh my God, I'd love like four weeks Dude. they get the four weeks over the 12 right um but yeah. but it's different for you because you're like you know you're six months on and maybe a couple of months off but but what do you do with like a full straight month off like what do you what do you think about yeah, doing your yeah, travel a, like what, what do you get up to it's a good great question because yeah you're right and and the truth is it's not i don't just have four weeks off i've had like three months off you know right, what I mean? right, so, right 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 uh, the, the the brutal answer is sit down and try and write album four <laughs> right <laughs> yeah is, so it's not that which much is, so which is, is not much for switch off no no, you're, no, honestly, no, it, it really isn't, you know, and I think as well, especially, you know, technically now I'm, I'm completely off clock, you know, because it's like nobody's rushing me for an album now, but you're right. You know, when you're, as we were last year, you know, we, we came home for like three months in the summer, but we were, we were doing five day writing weeks, you know? And so, yeah, it's hard. I think there's a lot of people don't see, but at the same time to, to, to answer your question, I'm a very geeky dude. I like watching television. And I like playing video games and, uh, you know, collecting Pokemon cards, reading manga, you know, doing all the, all the geeky, cringy stuff that, you know, almost makes my other life seem 
so much cooler, you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. yes, yes. I know exactly what you mean. So we are going to be playing the new album in its entirety today, which I'm so looking forward to, The Noble Art of Self-Destruction. It is out now via Sharp Tone Records. And as I mentioned earlier, so this is, this is like, out, like feels like album three of a trilogy, but I, I don't feel like maybe that that was intentional when you released album one. Like no. when, when you no. released album one, I don't think it was set in stone that this was going to be a trilogy. So, so how has that been sort of, uh, building a trilogy as it's been going. Yeah, well, I think, you know, um, I think the moment we realized this was a trilogy was when we started writing album three, actually. So we, there was no talk of the trilogy for the first two. And I, and I, I kind of like the way that shaped up uh, because it just meant that, you know, I think, you know, this this band will continue to to hopefully do fun and exciting things for people. But, you know, at the same time, I want to make sure we're always staying fresh and and I, I think we we decided at the beginning of this album that we still had one more album of like OG holding absence in us, you know? Um and and I think, you know, we really want to grow and progress over time. But I think at the same time we love what we're doing so much. We knew this album had to be a mixture of the first and the second album, you know, and more stuff on top, you know? So so yeah, it was it was fun kind of thing to hang over our heads almost because it meant that we wrote this album in a far more retrospective kind of respectful way almost you know because we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel we were just trying to put the final wheel on the vehicle Ah, okay got you got you right so we're getting to track one now head prison blues and i quite like that this one wasn't put out as a single but yet it was the opening to the album because usually a lot of opening tracks tend to be a single. So what was it about this track that you sort of maybe wanted to hold back a little bit? Well, first thing I'll say is, you know, we have quite a strict rule with this band where album one and the closing track should never be singles, in my opinion. Like when, you know, when you think about the art of an album, you know, I think the best moments should be the singles, you know, like Welcome to Black per- to the Black Parade, for example. But then at the same time, you know, when you, when you, listen to, you know, the first song of an album, that should feel like just as, you know, just as epic as the epic singles, you know? And I I think for us, it was like, I think we wanted this song to be like a hidden gem that, you know, you had to click. Yeah. And you had to click the play button on, you know, rather than we wheel this out to you a couple of months ago and here it is again, you know? Um, And to explain this song a little better as well, nothing too crazy, but, um, you know, the last two albums have started with epic minute long swells into like, you know, big halftime choruses. And we felt like with this album, we wanted to do something different. So this song is not the typical Holding Absence opening track. You know, it's like heavily inspired by like Taking Back Sunday and stuff like that. There's a lot of up tempo energy to this. Oh, one, you, know? you mentioned Black Parade MCR. And that was really what I was feeling and vibing with, with this track. As you say, that up tempo feel, like that moment <laughs> that. You know the black ray you know kicks in i, I yeah i'm not saying that it's like for light but i could definitely because i know you're a big mcr fan yeah, uh, is is that is that more subconscious than conscious when it comes to taking on influence like that um i mean at this point everything i do is inspired by my chemical romance <laughs> in some way you know? gerard so, are you um, listening but, <laughs> but to be fair you say another yeah you're right it's not that kind of kick into action you know which that that song has similarly so yeah let's do it this is head prison please prime audio radio you are listening to the album playback of the new album from holding absence the noble art of self-destruction that is track two from the album a crooked melody a massive anthem on this song i can see why you picked it as a single but there's quite a few actually on this album that could be singles. So was it difficult to, to pick those tracks that you wanted to highlight as a representation of the album? Yeah, it is always very tough. Um, you know, I think like you said though, a, a crooked melody is like a quintessential single, really. I think you'd, you'd struggle to put a song like this on an album and not release it as a single, really. Um, but yeah, you know, like when you think about the pre-album songs we, we put out, you know, like we'll speak about them in a minute, but like, Scissors and Honeymoon, for example, you know, they, they show the complete duality of this album and they still fit into that single kind of mold, I guess, you know? So, um, so yeah, so, you know, for us, it's, it's very much about, you know, kind of trying to reveal your cards without showing the whole hand, you know? 
Um, and, and I think an important thing to remember about our band is that we passionately believe that we're an album band. So truth be told, there are some songs like The Angel and the Marble, the last track. I want everyone who ever listens to our band to hear that song. But if we put it out as a single, it loses all the magic, in my opinion. So it's, it's trying to trying to understand how to package and songs and, and, and stuff like that, you know? You talk about The Angel of the Marble there, and I was thinking, uh, you know, have you ever been surprised at the popularity of, say, Wilt, which on paper you really shouldn't True. be like a massive yeah. single. Like, a massive yeah. song, but it's still yeah. one of your biggest. Yeah, um, I think, you know, in another planet, we don't write singles and we just write six-minute songs and, and we're a far crueler band almost, you know what I mean? But we, 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 we do try and have our cake and eat it. And I'm very grateful that our fans are so receptive to some of the more, you know, experimental, lengthy tracks, you know, because, you know, when you think about our discography between Penance, Wilt, Morning Song, Angel in the Marble, like those songs are all like six minutes plus and are all so emotional, you know? And, and I think like, we kind of like to write songs like that, almost like a treat for the album. You need to release a crooked melody to have the angel in the marble. The same way you need to release like a shadow to have wilt and stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Talk to me about the uh, the title of the album, The Noble Art of, of Self-Destruction. Again, it kind of feels like it's sort of continued on from The Greatest Mistake of the greatest, My Life. Yeah. And, you know, there's that sort of connection there. So just talk to me a little bit about that. Well, that was, yeah, that was actually the only thing that stopped me from, from one. Well, I didn't obviously, you know, but like the one thing that I was a bit like, oh, is it too close? Is because, you know, the something, something of something, something, <laughs> two albums in a row is like, I was like, oh man, are we like pushing our luck a bit with that? You know, but it just felt like a, a grand, beautiful, epic, yet introspective and flawed kind of title. You know, it's like, the, the the narrative of this album is very much about embracing your flaws and coming to grips with yourself and how to be a better person and and you know sometimes having to shed parts of yourself to grow um you know and and the noble art of self destruction you know just to mansplain it it's it's the idea that you know there is it is hard to do it but there is a beauty in being honest with yourself and embracing your flaws and also you know discarding the things about yourself that are good, I guess, you know, and this whole album is about kind of internalizing, I guess, my human experience, you know, more, more than ever before, I'd say. Mm, yeah. And I feel like when it comes to like, like that idea of destruction, actually better to do it in a way that perhaps you might be in some control of rather than going like off, off the wood. Cause like, I feel like most people probably have hit a point in their life where we've all hit that point where like the self-destruct button can be like ever so close. But if you can make like these smaller self-destructs, as you say, where it's like, for sure, right, for sure. we get and, rid of that, we get rid of that. Yeah. Rather than like this massive thing that could just implode your life. Of course, it's, it's, it's about managing yourself really, you know? And like, cause yeah, you know, I, I definitely don't think about, you know, I don't know, going out on a rager and I don't know, smashing a window and I think about like self destruction, you know what I mean? Like I don't mean it in like some sort of feral outburst, but more the idea of I guess breaking yourself down and, and trying to understand what parts of you are the best parts, you know? Um and we'll talk a lot more about that with the angel and the marble later. But yeah. Cool, cool. Let's get to the next track then, another single. And this sounded great at two thousand trees, I have to say. In fact, I thought it sounded heavier live. Yeah. which is quite interesting that's always I, and like and were there some like <laughs> cheeky like screams in this track i feel like there was something going on at trees there yeah we, we always we always try and i think it's just because our drummer ash is just like a closeted metalcore drummer you know and i like i think a lot of our music i think translates far more i guess passionately right you know what i mean there's there's a visceral like there's so many more emotions that we can express live and and funnily enough actually just before we play this next song you know a goal for this album was to try and marry our live show a bit more with our studio music because people would come up we did a tour just before we did this album and a lot of people would come up and say man you guys are way better live than you are on record you know and it's like that's that's kind of a backhanded compliment so it was a big goal on this album to make it feel you know almost like in, in some moments, but then at the same time, not, you know? Yeah, yeah. Let's get to this now. This is False Dawn.
Pram Audio Radio. That is track four from the new Holding Absence album, which is out today via Sharp Tone Records, Scissors. Now, just taking the face value of that, that could be about a whole myriage of things. So yeah, uh, yeah, yeah just yeah. Uh, to tell me a little bit about that track. Well, yeah, back to the, the self-destruction, you know, like Scissors is, I guess, Scissors is kind of a brutal take on this self-destruction theme. You know, it, it, if you listen to some of the lyrics are very, very, you know, um, dark, man. You know, it's, it's the idea of almost doing whatever you can to change who you are, you know? Um, and like, I don't know, I, like, for example, with the, the chorus lyric, like, pass the elastic and rope with a, a dull pair of scissors, I'll cut it myself. It's the idea that like, you know, it, it, it's going to hurt, but sometimes in life you need to get rid of things, you know? And um, so, yeah, so this song, I will say that this song is definitely up there in the the darker category of Holden Absence song. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You talked earlier about bringing the studio sounds to the live sound. And on this album, you went over to Canada to work with Dan Weller, who, of course, you know, has worked yeah. with so many amazing bands. Was that the first time that you went to a different country to, to go and record an album? How was that? Yeah, so, yeah, great question, man, because um, we basically, you know, uh, being generally defeatist and trying to be humble to, to the situation, you know, it's like, this is technically our last album with Sharp Tone, you know, and, and this is kind of like our last guaranteed studio experience, yeah. really, you know, and I remember at the foot of it, maybe I was just paranoid, but I kept saying to the boys, like, I don't know, this could be the last album we ever record, you know, and and I think a big part of us going to Canada was like, let's live a different experience while we record this album and it might breed like a unique sort of energy almost. Um, so that was, that was something we really, really wanted to do. And of course, back to Dan being a brilliant producer, you know, he, he did the greatest mistake of my life with us before. So we're very comfortable with him, but of course he's done loads of brilliant albums before, but I think for us, it was like, Dan is, is kind of our comfort zone in a way, you know, and like we, we work so well with him that, we were very confident, like flying him out to Canada and, you know, taking somebody that we're familiar with into unfamiliar circumstances might breed some sort of unique magic, I, I suppose. Um, and it was interesting because it did, you know, we, we, we recorded in the same studio that Silverstein, Cancer Bats, I think Alexis on Fire. I was going to say, in. so you took yeah. a British producer out to Canada. So what was yeah. it about that particular studio in Canada then that was sort of uh, alluring you to it? Well, um, I think it was mainly that, to be honest. You know, I know it sounds stupid as well, but like uh, being from Wales, you know, we've always viewed England as like the big, the big sibling, you know. And, mm. and I think growing up listening to scene music, when I saw a band was Canadian, I always just thought it was a little bit cooler, you know what I mean? Because I'm like, oh, they're not American, they're Canadian. You know? and, and, like, <laughs> gotcha, and I think yeah. that kind of carried over. And don't get me wrong, some of my favorite, but you know, like all those bands I just listed then, bands like Protest the Hero as well. There's so much good music from Canada. So I always felt like a weird kinship with Canada and, and, and the Canadian music scene for no reason whatsoever, really. But it's nice that we've kind of managed to cement that, you know? Um, so yeah. Let's get into track five now, Honeymoon. So there's a lovely acoustic start to this, and then it does sort of get, you know, builds and builds and builds. This feels like a bit of a different track for Holding Absence, I think. Yes, it really is, you know, and and I think um, think it's cool because, you know, we could, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but, you know, album four could be an album full of this kind of vibe, you know? It's like, it's weird. It's, It's like, acoustic rock shoegaze almost you know and uh and i love that and and when writing this song this is one of the the few songs i obviously the boys will always have input on everything but this is one of the few songs i brought the band and was like this is like something i've been working on you know and and i I sat down with an acoustic guitar and i said to myself one of my favorite songs of all time is where is my mind by the pixies and i was like how would that sound if deftones wrote it and I, I, and I, and I sat down and I tried to find the mixture between, you know, where is my mind, which is this epic, beautiful acoustic rock kind of banger, basically, and the epic shoegaze kind of energy of death zones, you know, and, um, I think it was cool as well because the song sonically starts how it started in, in its inception. It was just, just me and an acoustic guitar just kind of strumming away, you know, um, and I think, like you said, it, it does very much feel like its own song on the album. And, 
And at the same time, it does. I don't think it sticks out in a negative way at all. So, no, yeah. no. And I feel like when I uh, hear the word uh, honeymoon, a lot of time you can associate that with like honeymoon period. And I think a lot of bands go through that. And, it, you know, there's so much there. Yeah, if you think a relationship honeymoon period is something, you know, try a band one. Because, <laughs> you, yeah, know, you, yeah, fi- you know, sure, you're right. figuring out band life, you know, tours and, and all that. I feel like you probably come out of that honeymoon period now and this this album sort of almost kind of represents coming out of that period that's really interesting you know because i uh, truthfully i've basically the reason this song is called honeymoon is because i think it was like honestly 2017 2018 Mm. i i i realized how vivid the imagery is of those two words like honey you can see it straight away and the moon you can see straight away you know but i never thought about honeymoon being those two words before, basically, you know? And I was like, wow, what a vivid kind of collection of words that we almost overlook. But it, it has never had... God, I've never even thought about the fact that, that, that Honeymoon is a, a, a thing and evokes a feeling before. And, and yeah, you're right, you know, it's like, yeah. It's kind of, generally, you've kind of redefined that song in my head a little. <laughs> in, in, a, in a very in a very funny way so maybe yeah. there'll be a part two on the fourth album yeah. then <laughs> let's get to this now track five this is honeymoon prime audio radio you are listening to the album playback of holding absence the noble art of self-destruction i'm here with lucas woodland from the band that is track six from the album death nonetheless now you could you could take a track like that at face value and go that's that's pretty dark um but to me, that feels like there's a lot of catharsis going on here as well. Yeah, for sure. You know, this album is a journey at the end of the day, you know, and it's, it's trying to, I guess, contextualize and internalize, you know, the way we are as people and, and, and the flaws that we have. And, and I think this song is the moment where it's the out of body experience where you can just think, actually, like, who cares about any of this? You know what I mean? Life is short. Life is meaningless, you know? And, and I think this song is, um, some of my favorite lyrics on the album, for sure, but it, it's a very nihilistic, defeatist track, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, some of the, it's one of those songs you could sum up with, with a, a lot of different lyrics within it, you know, but, you know, there's, there's one lyric where I, I talk about how life is just insignificant, you know what I mean? And, and it's like, who cares, you know, like, uh, and, I, and I think there is that, ironically, a self-destructive energy to this song where it's like, it, who who cares whether I live or die, basically, because, you know, all these things, I think a lot of the time when people find themselves in that headspace, it's because they can't handle the things that they're feeling inside, you know? So this song is almost the boiling point of this introspection, you know? It's almost like I'm actually sick of thinking about myself. Like, I, I'm not trying to improve myself anymore. I just want to leave myself, <laughs> You know, mm. so yeah, there's a, there's a whole. I think it's where, like, like you know, uh, human beings almost struggle with purpose as well, because as you say, yeah, you you can take nihilistic views and go, well, you know, the, uh, even when the Earth goes and you know, there'll be the heat death of the universe and like what you know, sure. you, th- there's an infinite rabbit hole you can go down. I think one of my favorite quotes though is from Carl Sagan, who said that uh, our consciousness is humans. Uh, w- w- we are a way for the universe to know itself so we're not wow. we're not separate from the universe we we are the consciousness of the universe itself uh, and then that actually i think can actually give a bit more purpose to things because we think of ourselves yeah. i think as human beings we separate ourselves from everything from the universe from nature we we box ourselves off and that's yeah. what can make us feel so alone and so isolated and then we start to struggle with all of these nihilistic feelings. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think truthfully, you know, like the, the quote you just said as well, I think, you know, it's all about zooming in and zooming out. The further out you zoom, the less it matters. And, and actually, that's um, kind of where this song stemmed from. There's the lyric, I know someday I will be a small white cross upon a pale blue dot. And it's Ah, Basically pale blue dot, very nice. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, another Carl yeah, yeah. Sagan so, reference. <laughs> yeah, well, that's 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 what the um, yeah, the pale blue dot is obviously that image. Yeah. that shows Earth from millions of light years away, and and how funny it is that we're the the little dot by there, right? You know, and then for me, I I, I was like, you know, how do I make that seem even more insignificant? And then 
one of the things that came to mind for me was like, um, I grew up in a Catholic background and, and like, you know, when you go to a, a, a Catholic war kind of, um, cemetery, you know, they just completely, you know, in Ireland and places like that, they just completely covered with just small white crosses. And I always just found it bleak that like, you know, all these people lived lives and they had families and they had purpose and thoughts. And, you know, ultimately they just become another small white cross, you know, and back to the zooming out. I think this song is about zooming out of the world. And, you know, when you zoom out of this small white cross and then you zoom out of earth and then you zoom out into this, like we are all so insignificant when you really think about it. And I think this song is essentially that idea winning in a way you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we'll get to track seven now her wings which feels like potentially like yeah it could be quite a personal song uh, tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about this one so her wings is an interesting one because you know back to um you know death nonetheless and this kind of lull that the album existentially finds itself in her wings is a reference to the neil gaiman sandman comic book and the the character death is this you know this beautiful and kind woman but obviously she she represents death, you know, and, and, and I guess we always view death as this cold, dark thing, but I always found it interesting how Neil Gaiman, uh, portrayed her as actually very caring, you know what I mean? Um, and, and basically one of the comics is called The Sound of Her Wings. Um, and from there then I, I just, basically this song stemmed from that where it was like this kind of essentially romanticizing death in a way. So. In the, the narrative of this album, like these two, Death Nonetheless and Her Wings, very much hold hands. But I think Death Nonetheless is very nihilistic and very defeatist. Whereas I think Her Wings is is a, quite a beautiful song, actually. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of love and positivity, but ironically for a for a negative thing, you know. Absolutely. Well, let's get to this now. It's track seven, Her Wings. Prime Audio Radio, that is track eight from the new Holding Absence album, which is out now via Sharp Tone Records. I'm here with Lucas from the band. That is These New Dreams. And Lucas, one of the things that I absolutely love about this track, and it's not something that you hear too much in the rock and metal spaces, is dynamic range. You cool. Because yeah. everything's brick walled. And I yeah, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've yeah, got yeah. The, you know, I'm sure you're aware of things like the loudness war and you know, everything just being at peak all the times is that difficult to not fall into that trap where it's like everything's compressed everything's got to be up here but actually this is a track that audibly dips in volume which is quite nice yeah dude yeah great spot you know i think to that point just quickly before i answer the question i guess is um you know one of my favorite moments on this album is actually in this song because i sing the chorus in a very very low kind of register um, and there's a word that I, I, there's no melody to, I actually whisper the word, you know? So it's like, it's, it's like the most minimalistic you can get on, on an album like ours. I'm, I'm literally whispering over a piano for a brief second, you know? And, and I, I've always thought that was really cool because like you said, like dynamics, you know, the dynamics are so important to our band, you know, because the, the big bits, and I guess to the point you just made there, right? You know, it's like, if everything is a brick wall, then nothing feels brick wall. <laughs> That's right. Way, if everything's right? extreme, nothing's extreme. Like, exactly. And and mm. this song, and generally a, a, a trick that we use a lot is, you know, kind of engaging in minimalistic moments so that we can really maximize things, you know? Um, and I think, yeah, this song is, is, um, is a good example of that. And I think this song is also us scratching our kind of post-punk kind of recure itch a little bit similar to how we did with beyond belief on the last album so yeah well i i think the production is is, is more important than ever now because i do th feel like there's a lot of conversation about how a lot of bands at the moment sounds emerging some sounding the same i think a lot of that can be down to presets within uh, mm -hmm. tools like you know like pro tools and stuff like that and bands may start out with just a few presets but i think it can be very easy to fall in that trap. Is it? Is it tricky as a as a newer band? You know, you might listen to a band like The Cure and hear an album from the eighties with a very eidetic production, and even you know, you go back further, some of the albums from the sixties and seventies, and the recording in analog. Is it difficult to capture, you know, those beautiful moments that came in the past in a digital world? Man, that's such a great question because you know, I think 
you know, music, I mean, God, I, I, I will never find a way to word what I'm about to say. So in, in, get, get ready for a car crash. But like, you know, I think the, the best moments in music are the ones that have no, that, that are not replicable because they are just uh, the most perfect, m- minuscule little detail added to another minuscule little detail that will never ever be able to happen again, you know? And I think you're right. When every piano sounds the same and when every guitar tone is the same and when every plug-in is the same, you know, you, you do lose that kind of, that kind of energy. And, and one of my favorite things, like my parents are really big into music, you know, and I, I love talking to them about music. And my dad, like once a month, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll be listening to music in the house and he'll be like, oh, come and listen to this bit. And, and he'll kind of ask me how a noise is being made on one of his favorite songs, you know? It's like, because back then, nobody knew anything in the 80s, you know? And, and I'll say to him, oh, it's just a bit of feedback or he's just scratching the a reverb guitar, but he's not actually playing a note or whatever. And it's like, whatever. But it's like, I, I, I find like, there's such a beautiful naivety to that where it's like, I kind of wish I didn't know how any of this stuff was made, you know? Yeah. The, and, yeah, and I think the naivety, there's be- beauty and yeah. ignorance in a sense. Yeah, yeah man. And, and I think it's funny because yeah, now we're at the point where, you know, I, I, we, gr- me and the boys grew up demoing our songs with the Zach Farrow, um, brand new eyes drum samples and and you, and you think like oh man like my favorite album or one of my favorite albums and the drum sound is sensational but kind of loses its shine now I can just click it and make it my own if that makes sense you know what I mean so I will say though there is definitely a beauty to you know I, I if you were to, to talk about production the same way you talk about painting perhaps you know there is a real beauty to listening to an album and knowing that they only use this, like, a few paint colors or whatever. Like, you guys, you got what I mean? Like, you know, because I think that's something that we try and keep an eye on is, you know, we can, you can use any guitar tone in the world, right? But then does the album suffer because it, it just sounds like a mess, you know? Or do you use the same guitar tones and then the album sounds boring, right? You know? So it's, it's all about just trying to marry those. I think there's so much creativity that bands can have in the studio. And the more they explore that, I think the the stronger the albums will be. One of the yeah. um, favorite things I ever did in, in a studio, it wasn't related to music. So I, I, are you aware of like what Foley is? Yes, yeah, 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 like a Foley artist. Yes, like a Foley artist. So uh, if you're listening, watching this, and you're not aware what a Foley artist is, they recreate or they create sounds for film and TV purposes. And so I did this in uni as part of a studio production course, and I was tasked with recreating the battle scene of Troy, where the Trojans nice. and the Greeks have yeah. to meet and the two armies collide. And so the way in which I recreated that scene was by uh, I, I got about 15 metal chairs lined them all up on some stairs, mic'd it all up, pushed the stairs, uh, pushed the chairs down all the stairs. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah. Uh, and that was then the recreation for like two armies colliding. Uh, and nice. So, and I, so just things like that, you know, there's so many things that bands can explore in a studio without having to go to a preset. Oh, man, I, I'll never forget listening to Somewhat Damaged by Nine Inch Nails, which is the opening track on The Fragile. And, and like being like, hang on, is that, is that a saw? going back and forth in the textures of this song. And yeah, you know, he's just, you know, he's, he's doing the same kind of riff and, you know, all these different drum textures, but there was just a soul going back and forth in the background with no regard to time signature or tempo. It's just, it's just a noise, you know what I mean? I, I think, yeah, and you're right. And, and I guess it sounds stupid, but that's one thing I'll always commend Slipknot for is like, I know it was people. Yeah, gets a lot of crap, right? But you know, yeah, he did a dude, lot. He's done a cool. lot with that barrel. I have to say. Yeah, yeah, and and like at the time, man, like who on earth was using industrial objects to you know to further you know music production, right? I I guess, or or maybe not to that, you know, or maybe you know when you think about like I don't know, throbbing gristle and all the industrial bands that started all that stuff. You know, I know. Sorry, there's a million bands who do it, but you know. Seeing Clown from Slipknot hitting a, a keg on stage, you know, that's that's like that's cool as hell, you know. And, and I kind of wish more bands embraced that a little bit. More. Yes, yes. So we'll see. Maybe a keg on stage for the next album for holding yeah. up. And, <laughs> the big shift is coming. Uh, we get to yeah. track nine now. Liminal. I I feel like actually this also could have been a title for for the album because this is a, cool. a song that sort of 
to me, it seems like it's all, it's all about transitioning. Yes, dude, hundred percent. This song is about, you know, basically just being in the middle of everything, you know, and almost being frustrated by it because, you know, oh, to, to a point where you're happy to go forwards or backwards, but you're just sick of being stuck in the same place, you know? Um, but yeah, this song, and I like to think, you know, the, the song after this is, is the epiphany track. So I kind of like the idea that this song is actually about change because this is kind of the, the journey having that moment where it realizes that an epiphany is necessary, I guess, you know? So, yeah. Let's get to it. This is track nine, Liminal. Prime Audio Radio, that is track nine from the new Holding Absence, Liminal. And I've been here with Lucas Album. Uh, my long day. <laughs> uh, yes, these, these these bloopers. These this is uh, you know we'll leave it in, Lucas. We'll leave it in. Yeah, the beauty of mistakes. What we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will not be. I, I I won't be a hypocrite. There you go. Track nine, liminal, holding absence. You know what I think it is? It's actually a little tricky to say holding absence. The noble art of self destruction. That is that is quite. It's wordy. a lot of syllables, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And my name as well as a couple of syllables as well. If you're talking to just like a uh, Bob or something, it's easy, but Lucas Album. Yes. Uh, yeah. Lucas Album. There we go. Now. There we go. Uh, dude, this is this has been a pleasure. I, You know, it's been so nice because we've got to know each other a little bit over the past few years. First chat, you know, with the This Is One EP and through this whole album yeah. journey. And, you know, I'm, I'm really excited now for like where you go from from here. You, you mentioned briefly about a couple of thoughts for album four. But it, it feels like it's going to be quite different because this is this is the end of, of something for Holding Absence. For sure, man. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm glad to hear that because I feel the same way. I'm excited, you know, like finishing this trilogy now. I, it feels like liberating, you know what I mean? Because like I really feel like this is the the end of the beginning of our band's journey. But by no means is this the end for our band. And, and I just I can't wait to, to see what we become. and how we can, you know, continue to to connect with people. And one thing I, I want to make very clear is like, you know, holding absence needs no genre really, because who, you know, like, you know, if you listen to the last few songs, like the goal is to to throw people off a little bit and to try and write varied music. But I hope everyone understands that the intention is is what keeps it like a through thread and, and that is you know, just that, that human connection, the emotion, the, the passion, you know, and, and I think for this band, we, we've managed to accrue a really wonderful community of people that don't care about genre, that, but they, they do care about the message, you know, and, and I think for me now, as, as we move forward to album four, as long as the message stays the same, I'm just excited to see what the music will become, you know? Yeah, it's funny you say that. I was thinking that the Holding Absence fan base is, is, probably one of the fewer out there uh, that will be very receptive to change. I mean, like you would have to drastically change, I think, in order for the Holding Out yeah, fan base to be like, oh, what yeah. the f*** are you doing? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but, but, but generally speaking, it feels like you are taking your fans with you. That's not always possible for a band. A lot of bands have had to have some pretty like tough breakups with their fans in order to move forward. Yeah, you know, because I think it's two things. First and foremost, you know, we, you know, I say this all the time, but man, we, we, we are and we're and always will be scene kids, you know, and, and we grew up looking to all these bands. And, you know, I, I remember when bands made, I remember when this band took too long to release this album and people stopped caring. I remember when this band took too drastic a U turn and people stopped caring. And, and I think they're all lessons to be learned, you know. So I think, you know, a big thing about, us is that we're aware of the pitfalls, I think, because we're not trying to be arrogant about anything, you know? It's like, you know, I, I know some bands, and, and good to them because some of the best albums of all time were written like this, but I know some bands will disregard their fans to, you know, just kind of just take them on a journey that, trust me, bro, you will love this, you know what I mean? But there's we, we don't want that energy really I, I don't view myself as any better than anyone else or I, I know anything more than anyone else you know I'm just lucky to be at the front of all this but and I guess yeah like, like the second point you know is as well as us doing our homework is is like I just said you know we're we're very in touch with our fan base and, and I want to make sure that we take it a step at a time you know we we never 
lead them anywhere that they wouldn't want to go. Um, because I think, you know, that we've got a very, very close connection with our fan base, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Very briefly. I've just got to get my cat because he's trying to eat the leftovers of my lunch. <laughs> Taking a dart, mate. That is that's Caesar. Him. He is the emperor, no doubt. Uh, before we uh, wrap up uh, on the last track of uh, the album, The Angel in at the Marble, just uh, you know, tell me things that are going to be coming. I know you've got dates and then you know future festivals and stuff like that. So what's, uh, what's next for Holding Absence? Yeah, man. Like another... It's- funny to say but you know another world tour basically which is crazy but you know we our next show is in las vegas and we start a tour with senses fail for a whole month and then we fly all the way to australia and we do a couple of shows with thornhill and then we fly back home and we begin the noble art of self-destruction tour um and yeah that's that's in the uk and europe in november we're playing the biggest venues we've ever played and excited to play the best set we've ever played as well you know what i mean so the end of this year is looking to be a real celebration and, and we, as always, are just inviting everybody with open arms to come and enjoy it with us, you know? I think Caesar's uh, Even Caesar happy. is invited. He's <laughs> happy about that. He's looking forward to it. He has been a Holding Absence fan for as long as I have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to get into The Angel in the Marble now. So this is uh, track 10 from the album. And you, you talked earlier uh, about this track and its importance. So, um, yeah, just expand on that a little a little bit more. Well, I think this song is, is you know, I, for me, it's, it's the most emotional, candid song I've ever written for Holding Absence, I think. You know, I, I listen to this album, I, I've listened to this album, you know, obviously a lot of times, but every time I'm shocked with how poignant this song feels, you know what I mean? So so I really hope, you know, this song gets heard by as many people as, as possible, really, you know. But uh, yeah, a big part of this song is... um to go a little bit deep, you know, a, a big part of this album was inspired by Kintsugi, which is, you know, the Japanese art form of imbuing glue with gold and, and making broken things more valuable. Um, and at the foot of this whole campaign, I, I was doing some research on um, Michelangelo and, and, and David. And like, I, I heard a quote from him where he said, you know, basically someone said, how did you make David? And he said, um, there was an angel in the marble and I had to set it free. And it just felt like so poignant to me because I, I realized that, you know, this album, The Noble Art of Self-Destruction, it is about us as people being blocks of marble. And inside that marble can be anything we want. It is entirely up to you what you make of yourself. So this song is is kind of about that. And 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 the other thing, you know, which is another through narrative that I've spoken about a lot is you know, when you think about Kintsugi and you, and you think about marble sculptures, they are created through destruction. You know, they, you cannot make a marble sculpture without breaking it, essentially. And that kind of empowered me because I realized that, yes, I, I may have been hurt and broken in my life, but that means that I have more scope to, to learn from and more chance to become something better, essentially. So it all stemmed from there. And, and, and I think, that kind of was the precedent for this whole album. And ironically, this is one of the last songs that I actually finished because I knew how important it was, you know? So, uh, yeah. Amazing. Let's get into this now. And dude, this has been such a wonderful chat. The album is out now, The Noble Art of Self-Destruction, out now via Sharp Tone Records. Be sure to go buy it, you know, vinyl, stream, whatever. I'm pretty sure you're going to be looking at some chart positions, I've no doubt. Um, so let's see how far we can take that for holding absence. This is track 10, The Angel in the Marble. Lucas, thank you so much for your time today, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, man. So, pleasure as always. Primordial Radio.